Hi, I'm Dr. Rachel Lampert from Yale uh, School of Medicine. Hi, I'm Dr. Charlene Day. I'm from the University of Pennsylvania. And hello, I'm Mike Ackerman, a genetic cardiologist at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Well, we're really excited about presenting live HCM here at ACC 2023. And it, it actually, it takes us back a decade ago when the three of us were all shared decision-making minded physicians. And we've been letting our patients, young and old, be very active. And we said, why don't we look at this? We know that there are patients with HCM out there, some who are very active in terms of exercise, some because of recommendations of their cardiologists are very sedentary. And so we really sought out to test the hypothesis that those people with HCM who exercise the most, will they have any different degree of HCM triggered events compared to those patients with HCM who exercise the least? And here it is. The study design was a prospective observational study. Uh, we identified individuals from age 8 to age 60 who had either hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or a genetic uh, variant for HCM, and we enrolled them in a prospective study uh, to follow them over three years. Uh, every six months they received an online survey uh, asking whether they had had any of our outcome events, which included uh, resuscitated cardiac arrest, uh, a shock from their ICD, which we later adjudicated uh, to, to confirm it was appropriate for ventricular arrhythmias. That, of course, was for individuals who did have an ICD, as well as uh, syncope, which uh, was felt to be arrhythmic by our events committee. And we also quantified all-cause mortality. Uh, we uh, analyzed the data both uh, primarily for non-inferiority, hypothesizing that those who exercised vigorously would not have a higher risk of our composite endpoint, as well as looking for superiority on either side. Individuals were enrolled uh, across the whole spectrum of exercise, from those exercising vigorously and even competitively, to those uh, who were just doing moderate exercise, to those who had less active lifestyles. So our patients were enrolled uh, through 42 centers worldwide. We had sites in uh, not only the United States, but the uh, number of sites in the United Kingdom, as well as Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. So we enrolled 1,660 individuals, of whom 92% had overt hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, that is, they had left ventricular hypertrophy, and 8% carried the genetic variant alone without uh, LVH. Um, they, uh, 661 of them were the vigorous exercisers, and the remainder we combined into the moderate and sedentary group. Uh, it was about a quarter pediatric, less than 18, another quarter between 18 and 25, and then the rest were uh, adults from age uh, 26 to uh, 60. So uh, we're very pleased to present data describing that, uh, first of all, the overall event rate was low, less than 5% across the three years, uh, which calculated out to a rate per thousand person years of 15.3 for the, uh, the less vigorous, uh, compared to 15.9 for the vigorous per a thousand patient years. So this gave us a hazard ratio of 1.01, pretty close to unity, comparing the vigorous exercisers with those who were less active. Uh, this uh, hazard ratio did not, uh, the, the confidence intervals for the hazard ratio did not cross our pre-specified uh, boundary for non-inferiority of 1.5. We also looked at a variety of subgroups, uh, including those who, uh, including only those who had overt uh, hypertrophy, as well as uh, some other subgroups, and we found hazard ratios which were very similar, although in these smaller groups, of course, the confidence intervals were wider. Well, we find these data very reassuring in that the absolute risk of arrhythmic events in these patients was very low, and that the relative risk in those exercising vigorously or even competitively was not higher than those who were less active. So we think that these data challenge a widely held belief that patients with HCM who engage in vigorous activity or organized competitive sports are at heightened risk of arrhythmic events. This has been held for over four decades. And so we are excited that these data can now inform discussions around individualized shared decision making for patients for their, with their providers and their family and their athletic teams. So uh, we're looking to take even more deeper dives into this data, looking at some subgroups, for example, those who have defibrillators, um, looking at some other questions in this group itself. 
Uh, we also have, uh, at the same time we initiated the Live HCM study, we also initiated another study uh, that was parallel called Live Long QT, asking the same questions about a different population, the uh, individuals with, with a, uh, the channelopathy or, or electrical disease of Long QT syndrome, but for whom similar questions existed. Um, as far as next steps, so that study's in a phase where we should be analyzing that fairly soon, and we're looking to present that data uh, you know, within the year. Um, next steps, I think we'll be wanting to look at some uh, wider populations as well. Um, there are many other channelopathies, many other cardiomyopathies for whom these same questions exist. I think in terms of next steps is getting out the message of, of good news. This is really good news for our patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy for far too long. I think the guidelines probably have inadvertently resulted in a sedentary lifestyle for our patients with HCM and we have essentially deprived them of what we all know that exercise is good medicine and is probably the best pill that we have for all patients with all heart diseases and now even patients with HCM. We can tell them with a very rigorous study that there's no signal of heightened risk among those who exercise the most compared to those who are the most sedentary. So I think people, not only patients, families, but also the cardiology community ought to be able to take this as really good news.